Yeah, good morning, everyone. Yes. Um, good morning, Pastor. Good morning to those who are online as well. Yes. Um, if any one person uh, could open with a word of prayer, uh, we will then get started after that. Uh, anyone here in the classroom, if you could just begin with a word of prayer, please. Yeah, let's not waste time because you know we have very limited time. If any person could just volunteer and start off with a word of prayer, please. Okay, anyone online would like to pray? Yeah. Father God, okay, this is something that I will do every time. I will be asking, so just be mentally prepared for that. If anyone could just open with a word of prayers because. It's good if the Lord blesses the class, you know. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Yeah. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We honor you for gathering us together. We pray that your presence will be with us and we pray that you'll grant us understanding. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. So last class, I was unable to come here. Uh, but I did a recording of the session. So uh, if anyone has viewed that video on Exodus, and if you have any doubts or questions, um, we can begin with that. So here in the class, if you have viewed the video on Exodus, and if you would like to ask any questions, uh, you can raise your hand. In the same way, those who are online, if you have any questions from uh, the Exodus uh, recording which I had done, uh, you can ask, you can post your questions in the chat, or you can just simply unmute uh, and you know ask your question. If no one has any questions, then you know we will start with today's topic, which would be Leviticus. Okay, I don't see anyone raising a hand, uh, so let's begin today with uh, the book of Leviticus. Um, if you were to look in your notes, it basically describes Genesis as the book of beginnings, uh, while Exodus is described as the book of redemption, because um, Exodus talks about how the Lord redeems his people from slavery in Egypt. So while Genesis is the book of beginnings, Exodus is the book of redemption, Leviticus, on the other hand, is called the book of atonement, because um, this book focuses on how God delivered his people from their sins, how he made uh, a provision for them to be forgiven so that they can be reunited with him. So the focus of Leviticus is on uh, atonement, it is on holiness, uh, it is on uh, reuniting uh, being of uh, of being reunited with the Lord. Okay, so that would be the main focus of Leviticus. So, which is why when you look at the book of Leviticus, you see a lot of um, uh, procedures being described on what the people need to do, uh, what are the steps that they need to take, what are the sacrifices which they need to perform. All of these procedures will enable them to draw near to God once more. So Leviticus is a book of all the sacrifices and rituals which the people are supposed to uh, perform to be able to draw closer to the Lord. In the same way, Leviticus also gives a list of instructions to the priests. Um, the priests are supposed to um, help the people. Uh, the Levites and the priests are supposed to help the people in performing all these sacrifices and rituals. So there are many instructions given to the, to the leadership, to the priests and to the Levites on what they are to do uh, to draw near to God. So these things are all uh, detailed in, uh, you know, in, in very, with a lot of instructions and clarity in this book of Leviticus. Now, let's just briefly look at the structure of this book before we get into some of the main concepts and highlights. So this particular book maybe can be divided into five portions. Yeah, I think that would uh, make sense. So chapters 1 to 7 can be the very first section. 
because in these seven chapters uh, the book begins by talking about the five sacrifices and offerings which the people need to make to be able to draw near to god and then chapters 8 to 10 could be the second section so in chapters 8 to 10 that is where moses stands at the entrance um of his tent and he gives instructions to all the priests and the leaders on what they should do how they should help the people what are the duties they must perform at the tabernacle all these things instructions are given in chapters 8 to 10 and then in chapters 11 to 15 that is where you have a long list of all the things which are clean and the things which are unclean the things which the people should avoid so that they can keep themselves ritually pure so those things are given in chapters 11 to 15 maybe chapter 16 can stand by itself chapter 16 if you notice is at the center of the book of leviticus and that is the chapter which focuses on the day of atonement so um that chapter talks about how once a year the lord expects the priest and the people to perform a certain ritual and the lord will look upon that ritual and he will turn away from his anger and not allow his anger to be unleashed upon the people so uh, the day of atonement is very significant uh, we will talk about it in greater detail in a short while and then the last section would be chapter 17 to 27 where you again have a long list of laws um about um uh how to avoid the customs of the other nations how to you know um uh, not indulge in any kind of idolatry uh, you have laws which talk about property uh, laws about land uh, uh, land laws uh, you have laws about um, the festivals which the people need to perform so you have all these described in chapter 17 to 27 and then in chapter 23 uh, you know which is part of this section in chapter 23 it talks about the sabbath year and the year of jubilee that is a little significant so based on the time that we have we will look at uh, whatever we can cover in this um, you know in the, in the in the short time that we have so to get into the highlights of the book of leviticus in this book of leviticus that word holy is mentioned i don't particularly remember now but i think it was 137 times that word holy is mentioned in this book of leviticus because this book is all about how god is completely holy and he has come to live among a people you know he says i will come and dwell among you in the tabernacle so this very holy god has um condescended you know and allow and humbled himself to come and live among an unclean people so that is the love that he has towards these people and so his cry is that because i am so holy please understand the privilege which you are being given and keep yourselves holy keep yourselves in a way which would be acceptable unto me okay so um, i'm not sure what the fun and the jokes are all about over there uh, but please if you could just focus um, so um, this uh, particular book talks about the holiness of god the hebrew word that is used for holy is the hebrew word kadosh um now this word kadosh basically has um two implications if you're applying this word kadosh to humans it's talking about how the people are supposed to kadosh themselves they're supposed to set themselves apart that word kadosh literally means to set yourself apart to separate yourself for for one specific purpose so when you apply this word kadosh to humans the lord is basically telling the people you have to set yourselves apart for me and me alone you cannot have loyalties towards any other gods your entire loyalty has to be towards me and towards me alone so kadosh is talking about being set apart and in that sense you would apply it to people so the lord says you know in so many places in scripture it says be holy you know because you because i am holy you also must be holy so we understand that the people 
are being called upon to be holy, to be kadosh, to be set apart and dedicated to God and to God alone. Now, how would we use this word for God himself? Because we say that God is also kadosh. God is also holy. In what sense is God set apart? I mean, he doesn't dedicate himself to himself. When we apply that word to humans, it's talking about how people have to set themselves apart and dedicate themselves to him alone. But in what sense do you apply that word kadosh to God? So when, it, when, the, when that word is used for the Lord, it means that he's set apart in the sense he's completely different, completely unique, completely exclusive. There's nobody or anything like him. There, there, there never was any, anything or anyone like him, and there never ever will be. He's completely apart from creation. He isn't, he isn't like people. He isn't like the created things. He's completely different and apart. So, so the word kadosh, when we apply it to God, it talks about his distinctiveness, his uniqueness, his complete otherness from everything that is, you know, human. So um, in Leviticus 11.44, when the Lord says, I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. He is basically saying, I am distinct. I am unique. I'm completely set apart. So because I am very, very different from this human man-made gods which people have created, you must therefore set yourselves apart to worship me alone. I will not tolerate the worship of any other gods. So because he is completely unique and distinct, he alone deserves worship. Nobody else can share in this loyalty. Only the Lord deserves our complete loyalty. Okay, so in that sense, this word kadash is used approximately 137 times in the uh, book of Leviticus. So when this, when this apartness of God, this, this, um, this very unique, uh, this great uniqueness of God, when that is manifested in a way which people can see, that is basically called the glory of God. So God is spirit. He is invisible. We cannot see him. But he manifests this uniqueness of his sometimes in a way which people can see when he comes down maybe in a cloud upon the tabernacle or when people can sense his presence in the room. So at such times, this uniqueness, this kadash of God, his, his distinctiveness, it is, it is uh, manifested in a way which people can sense and feel. That is called the glory of God. Uh, let's look at another verse. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Yeah, without wasting time, if you can keep your Bibles open in the future, if someone could read out for us Leviticus 10 verses 1 to 3, please. Then, then Nabav and Abihu, the son, the son of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and divorced them. They died before the Lord, and the Moses said to ha Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regretted as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Here in these verses, we see how Aaron's sons, the sons of the high priest, I mean, at least they should have had more brains, you know, the sons of the high priest, they do not give God the glory that he deserves. He is set apart. He's unique. He's distinct. But they treat him the way they would treat any human God. You know, if you, go to, uh, if you were to go to any of the other nations of that time, those people of the other nations, they offer lip service to their human gods. 
you know, to the gods who that they have created. When it comes to rituals, they perform the rituals. But when it comes to their heart and their conduct, they are uh, they compromise. They are reckless. And these two sons of the high priest treat this very other distinct living god in the same way they would treat maybe another human man-made god. And so the Lord is angry. He gives very clear instructions on what kind of rituals they must perform in his presence. But here you have these two uh, sons of Aaron ignoring those instructions. And they think, what is there? Let's do some adjustment in these things which God said. Instead of following exactly what he told, let's do it in our way. And so when they offer unauthorized fire before the Lord, the Lord's anger is released against them and they both are killed. And it says over here, Aaron held his peace. He did not open his mouth. He did not protest because he understood that this God is not like any other God. He deserves all glory and his sons refused to give, the, give God the glory that he deserved. So Moses clarifies and he says, this is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So if you were to look at the actual Hebrew used over there, the Lord is saying, I must be regarded as Kadash. I must be regarded as set apart. In other words, he is saying, the way you conduct, conduct yourselves in my presence, it should display who I am. It should display the fact that I am wholly distinct, completely different. If you start treating me the way you treat other man-made gods, then that does not bring me glory. And so these two sons of Aaron did not give me the honor that I deserved. And so the Lord's anger is stirred. And in fact, he punishes them by killing them. This story should give us an idea of exactly what the holiness of God means. I mean, we have this very human uh, image of, uh, you know, of God in our minds because Jesus chose to become like us and come down to the earth to be with us. So which is why we, we understand him so well because he became a human like us, lived like us, uh, went through the difficulties that we go through on this earth. So God put a human face, um, you know, uh, uh, on Jesus so that it would become easy for us to understand what God is like. But because of that, we sometimes don't value who he is. We forget that, yes, Jesus came down to be with us and became human, but it does not take away the fact that he is completely divine. He is completely distinct and other. And we treat him like as if he's one of us, you know, one of our pals. He's not one of your pals. He is God. He is holy. He is completely different from all the rest of creation. And so we cannot just take him lightly. We are supposed to treat him with complete reverence and respect, even though he humbled himself enough to come down and become one of us. So maybe if you could read out one verse, Isaiah 40, verse 25. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25. To whom, to whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, say the Holy One? The Lord says over here, uh, the Holy One, the Kadosh One, this is what he says. He says, to whom will you compare me, or who is my equal? Nobody else anywhere is like me. I'm completely distinct. So therefore, the entire book of Leviticus is focusing on this complete otherness and distinctiveness and uniqueness of God and saying, you are in the presence of a very holy God. The one who said, I will come and dwell among you. He is very, very, very unique and different. So treat him with the honor and respect that he deserves. So 
an entire book was written uh, to knock this truth into the people's heads that they are not to treat this God lightly just because he has humbled himself to come and dwell among them. They must not take him lightly. So this is something that uh, the people of uh, Israel had to take seriously back at, in those days. And it's a, it's a, we have to take that same principle equally seriously today. Why? Because today he's not just dwelling among us, he's dwelling in us. It is shocking. He's not just dwelling among us. He literally is dwelling in us. So imagine how our conduct should be. Imagine what our thought life should be. Imagine the choices that we should be making because we are in the presence of a very, very holy God. So even if you forget everything else about Leviticus, Remember this one verse where he says, because I am who I am this kind of a person, because I am this holy person, you also must be holy. That is the expectation that the Lord has of us. Um, now, coming to some aspects which the Lord, you know, instructs the people about, because he is who he is, um, he gives various instructions. One of the ritualistic instructions which he gives the people is about how they should um, avoid certain things, how they should avoid uh, certain uh, actions. So among this, that long list of uh, things which the people should avoid so that they can keep themselves clean, one instruction is given in Leviticus 11 about their food habits. So if you were to go to Leviticus chapter 11, over there you see um, the instructions which are given about the things which they can eat and the things which they should not eat. And if you look at some of the details given over there, you would see that if a animal, it chews the cud and if it has a divided hoof, then um, you are allowed to eat such animals. On the other hand, if there are animals which do not chew the cud, which do not have a divided hoof. Such animals you are not supposed to eat. So this is the one of the laws which is given for the uh, Israelites of the Old Testament. Uh, and in the same way, it even talks about the sea creatures. It says that if, an, if a sea creature has, has got fins, if it has got scales, then yes, you can consume it. On the other hand, if a sea creature does not have fins and scales, then you must not eat eat uh, eat it. So, in uh, what is the what is the criteria? What is the thought behind this? Why does God say that certain things will be declared clean and certain things will be declared unclean? On what basis is He making this division? If you notice, uh, when it comes to animals, most of the animals um, which God created at the time of uh, you know creation when all animals were not uh, were when all animals were herbivorous they would only eat plants they would not eat each other so the way god designed and meant animals to be you know they were supposed to uh, feed on plants and then they would chew the cud you know and uh, uh, so that is the norm which god established in the beginning but after the fall, when sin came into the world, animals changed. Animals began to attack one another and, you know, prey upon one another. So that was not the original norm which God had established. So he declared these things which have gone um, apart from his original design. He declares them as unclean, as something that should not be consumed. In the same way, when you look at the sea creatures, almost all of the sea creatures will either have fins or they will have scales on their skin. But there are some sea creatures which are an exception. They are not the way God originally intended things to be. So such things such as you know your prawns and your lobsters and your oysters, they don't have fins and they don't have scales. And the Lord says, these things, I declare them as unclean. So it's like as if God is using these 
creatures as an object lesson to convey something to the people is basically saying i designed creation in this particular way this is what i had in mind for humans this is what i had in mind for animals anything which has gone away from that original design and plan i look upon it as unclean it's an object lesson which god is using you know to to tell them what should be regarded as clean and what should be regarded as unclean how did it apply to the to the people of israel he's basically saying in the same way some of the animals are still following the original design and you know they are not eating one another they only eat plants in the same way you people of israel also have to keep yourself set apart and follow my original design for you all don't be like all the other nations the other nations have gone far away from my original design and plan they do what they want to do but you just like these animals that you are seeing you have to keep yourself set apart and hold on to the original design which i designed for you okay so it's what the lord is, con- is uh, it's the lesson which the lord is trying to convey uh, through this so this very superficial understanding that people have that god told people uh, the old testament people uh, israelites to eat certain things and not eat certain things he just told them for the sake of health reasons but that is not a very good explanation right because once the new testament came along once jesus came and finished the work on the cross uh, god declared now onwards you can eat whatever you want so does that mean that god stopped caring about the health of people in the new testament times doesn't make sense right so that's a very superficial explanation there was a spiritual reason why god brought used an object lesson in the old testament times so that object lesson doesn't apply now because now god has declared from any nation not just the israelite nation from any nation if people come to me i will declare them as clean so now anybody can be clean so which is why that object lesson of the old testament does not apply anymore because now even a non israelite you know like all of us sitting over here even we non israelites can go to him and he will declare us clean through the blood of jesus christ so that old testament object lesson no longer applies to us who are living in the new testament times so there was a spiritual principle that god was trying to bring out uh the distinction which he made and the instruction which he gave them not to eat certain things it was not uh, for health reasons there was a theological principle that god was trying to bring out um so having understood a little bit about this whole idea of you know clean and unclean uh, let's move into the next concept uh, the, the very important concept of the day of atonement so the people living in the land of israel um they were expected to follow certain rules certain conditions which god had laid upon them if they broke those rules and conditions god would declare them as having sinned okay so but because of the fallen nature of the people even though they knew in their minds that they are not supposed to break these rules people would again and again you know sin and they would break those rules so god had to make a plan to continue protecting them so that his righteous anger is not unleashed upon them because he's literally living among them is allowing his holy presence to be there among them so how to preserve and protect these people from his anger so every single day you know if you if you were to look into the other scriptures it talks about how every single morning every single evening a sacrifice was made for the sins and the cleansing of the people every single day in the morning and in the evening the the um, the sacrifice is performed so that god's anger is not released upon the people however once a year this is this an extra ceremony which was done and that would be the day of atonement where um two goats were sacrificed and these two goats the lord would look at those two goats and the lord would recognize that one day these two goats will be represented by jesus christ himself 
So, on the basis of what Jesus Christ would do in the future, the Lord would accept those two goats, which are being, you know, um, uh, in the um, being um, sacrificed and also being condemned. So he would recognize those two goats as representing Jesus Christ in the future, and he would accept the two goats and he would not release his anger upon the people. So this was done once a year. Um, and uh, so if someone could read out for us those verses, and then we will look at how those two goats uh, represent Jesus. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verses 6 to 10, if you could first read out that. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 6 to 10. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is not for himself, and make atonement for himself and his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's, the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the Lord fell to to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Yes. So these two goats are representing two different aspects of what Jesus Christ did for us. So um, they would cast lots to you know um, determine which one should become the sacrifice and which one should become the um scapegoat so depending on how the you know the lots fall uh, it would be decided that one of the goats will become the sin offering so that particular goat would literally be taken placed upon the altar killed and its blood would be shed and then using that blood you know the the tabernacle would be purified uh, and blood would be that some of the some of that blood of that sin offering would be sprinkled upon the mercy seat which, which is the covering on the Ark of the Covenant. So all this would be done using that particular goat, which is representing what Jesus Christ did for us. The punishment which we should get, instead it was given to him. So in the same way back then in Old Testament times, the punishment which the people of Israel should have got on their heads, instead that was placed upon the goat and the goat was sacrificed on the altar as a sin offering. So that is regarding the first goat. The second goat is representing another aspect of the Lord Jesus. This goat, if you notice, um, okay, maybe we can read out Leviticus 16 verses 20 uh, to 22. Leviticus 16 verses 20 to 22, if someone could read out. And when he has made an end of and annoying for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring uh, the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the children and Israel and all the transactions concerning all the sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabitant land, and he shall uh, release the goat into the wilderness. All right. So if you look at the second goat, here Aaron is doing something different. He's not doing the same thing which he did with the first goat. Here, he places both his hands upon this goat, and he transfers all the sins of the people onto the goat. Uh, it's that's what it says over there in uh, verse 21. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. This was not done with the first goat. This is being done with the second goat. So what is the distinction? If you look at the first goat, that goat was symbolically clean. It was undefiled. It was pure. Aaron did not lay his hands upon it and contaminate it 
you know, uh, by transferring all the sins of the people onto it. That goat was pure, undefiled. It represents in what state Jesus went onto the cross. When Jesus went onto the cross, he was pure. He had never sinned. He was tempted just like all of us, but he never gave into the temptation and he was completely sinless. Um, we can actually see that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. If someone could turn and read out that, you know, turn to that in their Bibles and read it out. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. Because that is what the first goat is talking about. 1 John 3, 5. And you know that he has manifested to take away our sins. Mm -hmm. And him there is no sin. In him there is no sin. So this goat which got sacrificed on the altar, it's representing his purity, his innocence. In spite of being holy and innocent, he got punished instead of the people being punished. So the second goat, on the other hand, Aaron places his hands upon this goat and all the sins of the people are transferred. You know, the sins which they have committed over that entire one year, it's all transferred onto that animal. So now that animal is bearing the entire blame of all the sinful deeds. It is one really cursed, fully blamed animal now. So in that condition, it is driven out of the community because God lives in this Israelite community. The holy God lives over here. And now this, uh, this goat, which is carrying upon its head all of the sin, all of the blame, it cannot stay there in the presence of a holy God. So it's literally driven out of the community. It's taken away somewhere in the wilderness and it will roam around over there until it dies. What is the, what is the significance of this? Let us say one day after this day of atonement ceremony is performed, you know, um, in the book of Job, we read about how the accuser, Satan, the accuser goes to the throne of God and accuses people, right? So let's imagine that one day after the day of atonement, Satan is going to God's throne and he's saying, you know what Aaron did last week? Aaron, he committed that sin last week. And God would say, what sin? I don't see any sin on Aaron's head. Because you see the sin, there's no sin resting on Aaron's head because it was placed, it was transferred onto the head of the goat. And that goat was driven away out of God's presence, which means God cannot see any blame in Aaron. The blame which he had, which he was supposed to bear, the goat has taken it away. So there's a very beautiful aspect of what Jesus Christ has done being represented by the second goat. Once the Lord has forgiven us of our sins, God does not keep looking at us and remembering and thinking about what we did. Because like the goat, Jesus took it upon his head and he was taken out of the city and crucified. So he has finished taking the blame. Now God will not blame us. That is the forgiveness which we have in him. So that is the value uh, which we find in the um, object lesson of this second goat. So which is why it says, um, yeah, maybe we can actually read out those verses. Hebrews 13 verses 11 to 12. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 11 to 12, please. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is uh, brought into sanctuaries by the high pri priest for son are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood and suffered outside the gate. So Jesus suffered outside the gate because inside the gates, what do you have? You have the temple of God. You have the presence of God inside the gates. And now Jesus has, has taken our blame, our sin upon himself. So he cannot be inside the gates in the presence of God. He needs to go outside and suffer outside for us. And Jesus did that so that the people who are inside the gates, if, what did it say? What does it say over here? It says to make the people holy, to make the people acceptable. It's so beautiful. He went outside the gates so that we can stay inside the gates 
in the presence of God symbolically. So that is the, uh, you know, the beauty of what God has done for us. And uh, so just to conclude this thought, uh, maybe we can look at one more uh, passage. Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Romans 3, 25 and 26. Whom God set forth as the prospitation by his blood through faith to demon uh, straight his righteousness because in his for forbearance God has passed over the sins that were uh, previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness and he might be just and justifier of the one who had faith in Jesus. Yes. So in verse 25 it says, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So all the sins committed by the people in the Old Testament times, in his forbearance, he left them unpunished because he was looking ahead to a day when Jesus Christ would fulfill that duty for us. So he he bore patiently the sins of all these Israelites because those two goats can actually not wash away anybody's sins. I mean, they are just goats. So what the goats could not do, but they were symbolizing what Jesus would do. So looking at what Jesus would do in the future, God patiently bore the sins of the Old Testament people because he was looking ahead to a day when Jesus would permanently do what these goats could not accomplish. Okay, So there's a lot of uh, uh, rich doctrine uh, contained in these verses. Uh, okay, So um, moving from there into the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee. This is something the Lord commanded the people to do. Um, if, we, if maybe we could read out Leviticus chapter 25, verse 4. Leviticus 25, verse 4. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. All right. Here in this verse, the commandment which God is giving the Israelite people is that for six years, you can, you know, uh, plant in the, in the fields. You can put seeds in the ground. You know, you can harvest the crops. For six years, you're allow allowed to do this. But in the seventh year, you must allow the ground to rest. The entire seventh year, nobody should go into the fields and plow the ground or sow the seeds or do any kind of uh, you know uh, plantation work. The seventh year, you should just leave the land to rest. Now, of course, you know um, this is such an important principle because uh, people have not followed these principles which God has laid down. We find the world, you know, in the condition that it is in today. I mean, um, uh, the environment is in a very terrible condition today because people have not taken care of what God gave to people. Uh, if you if you remember at the time of creation, God says to Adam and Eve, "You are rulers. You are meant to rule over this earth." So, as rulers, they were supposed to take care of the world which God had given them. But because of the sin, because of the fall, you know, people began to be selfish and no longer took note of what God wants. And so in the process, they destroyed the earth. So here, the Lord is laying down a principle and saying, you can sow and reap for six years, but in the seventh year, do not touch the ground. Let the ground just rest. Because then in the seventh year, the ground will be able to recover. It will be able to nourish itself once again. And then there's another commandment which the Lord gives, which is in another verse, Leviticus 25, verse 10, if you could read out. Leviticus 25, verse 10. And you shall concentrate the uh, 15th year, sorry, 5th year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all in its inhabitants. It shall be a uh, jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his uh, 
position and each of you shall return to his family so every seventh year they're supposed to leave the fields uh, to rest and so they do this for um seven sabbath years so you have six years of sowing and reaping the seventh year they're supposed to leave it alone again they have sowing and reaping for another six years and the next sabbath year comes so in this way seven sabbath years go by which means 49 years have now gone by and then you enter into the 50th year that would be the year of jubilee and god's instruction is yes it's true that just last year was sabbath year so you know you left the uh, the field alone but now my commandment is in the 50th year also allow the um, ground to rest do not do any sowing and reaping which means in the jubilee year there uh, in the in the sabbath year in the in the in the 49th sabbath year and the 50th jubilee year for two entire years the field should not be plowed so for two years the people cannot do any planting and reaping and this is the promise which god makes he says um, that he would provide so much crops in the previous years that they will not starve so even if you don't touch the ground for two years the lord says i will provide so much for you in the previous years that you will have what you require now this was a test of faith for the people for them it might have been difficult enough to you know avoid plowing in the seventh year an entire year not doing any plowing not growing any crops that would require some trust and faith in the lord but in the jubilee year it gets even more tough because they have not for an entire year they have not done any plowing and reaping and now the next year also they are not allowed to plow and reap so for two years now they have to trust the lord but the lord says you will have so many fruits growing on your trees you will not lack in any way is the promise which god makes and i don't think that the israelite people kept these commandments to a great extent because their faith was weak but this is what god wanted so he wanted them to trust him enough where they will leave the ground alone and trust him to take care of them so where the israelite community failed are we willing to step in and display that kind of a faith because there are times where god says to us do this and then you know we may think oh this is going to harm me this is going to harm my interests my personal interest if i obey god in this particular thing but the lord says i know how to take care of you will you trust me and see the 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 rich harvest which i bring into your life because the promise which god made you know regarding the jubilee year he says if you leave the ground alone for two years don't worry i will give you such a lot of you know um uh, fruits and vegetables in the meantime that you will not lack in any way you will not even feel the lack that takes true dependence and faith so to a great extent the israelites just ignored that commandment they did not keep it but today we of the new testament times who literally have god dwelling in us are we living are we are we willing to trust him in that manner the lord says do this give up this are you willing to give it up are you willing to trust him to that extent because he says i will not let you down i will take care i mean that is who that is his character he is a faithful god so if he says if you if you obey me sincerely and give up this thing which i am asking you to give up will i not take care of you will i not provide for you so that is a it was a step of faith which the lord wanted the people to take in the sabbath year and in the jubilee year and it also would be the year when people would have to return the property which they have taken from others so you know if if a if a israelite has become very very poor and he has sold his property to somebody else that person has to return the property to him in the jubilee year because god did not want anyone in the israelite community to become too poor you know nowadays the rich keep grabbing the property of the poor and the poor become poorer and poorer and poorer but god did not want that so he said in the jubilee year even if you have taken somebody else's property you know and paid money for it 
give it back to them as a gift free why are you doing that because again you are expressing your trust in him he will take care so leviticus is a book about god's holiness and about the instructions which he has given and if we honor god if we trust god you know we will keep those things is what the lord was telling the people of the old testament so if we can just close with a word of prayer Lord, we just thank you so much for the learnings which are contained in the book of Leviticus. We thank you, O oh Lord, that they bring out um, the value and significance of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. So we pray that out of honor and respect for you, we will keep ourselves set apart for you alone, and we will honor you and trust you. by following your instructions no matter how difficult they are help us a lot to live in that manner thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you